Well, good afternoon and welcome everyone. I'm Dr. Beverly Rubick. And if you're here, it's because you're taking the red pill. Uh, let me just tell you what we're going to talk about today and maybe you can decide whether you want to stay. I'm going to talk about 5G, the fifth generation of wireless and exactly how it works. Uh, hopefully you'll totally understand it by the end. And some of the pitfalls of it, also some of the litigation and public policy surrounding it. And the last part of my talk, I'm going to talk about ways that you can, um, let's say, practice enhanced self-care to overcome some of the ravages of wireless on health and wellness. So that's what we're about. Uh, just to give you a little bit about my background, I'm a, I have a PhD in biophysics, uh, earned at University of California at Berkeley. And I'm known for working on uh, the energy field of life, uh, the so-called biofield. I coined the word uh, in a team at NIH back in 1992 and got, got it accepted as a national subject heading at the Library of Medicine. So I'm quite interested in the human energy field and I'm also interested in the influence of electromagnetic fields on our biofield and on our physiology and biochemistry. Uh, and so uh, both therapeutically as well as uh, a stressor. So you're going to hear about the stress side of it today. And we liken Wi-Fi or wireless to kind of a digital tobacco. And these are some of the ads from the 40s and 1950s. Smoking is one considered glamorous and even recommended by physicians, healthcare workers, and advertised by movie stars. But over the decades, we've learned that smoking is harmful to our health, causing lung disease and even cancer. So in, so in a similar way, wireless is kind of a fad of our times. We have many wireless things where we don't even need wireless. For example, a wireless keyboard, a wireless mouse uh, on a desk uh, top computer. Uh, you're not running around the house. You don't really need these separate things. They could easily be wired and lower your exposure and are safer consequently. So, some have called wireless the tobacco of the digital age. But unfortunately, unlike tobacco, we can't smell it, we can't taste it, we can't sense it. Uh, there are some people who can, and we call them the electrosensitives. But actually, we're all energy beings, and sooner or later, if we continue our exposure, I anticipate that we're going to see more electrosensitivity, which actually the World Health Organization has already uh, documented, and it's on the rise. So we're going to talk about that too. But we have an increasing plethora of wireless devices. You know, there was the cell phone and tablets and computers using Wi-Fi and Wi-Fi routers and the smart meter is now being introduced, which is really part of the smart grid. Uh, smart meters are also blasting radio frequencies, microwaves into our environment. And even though they say it's a rare occurrence, we can measure them with meters and I can tell you it's quite frequent that these things are sending signals and blasting us with radiation right in our own homes if you have a smart meter. In many states you can opt out and go back to analog. So here's a little bit about the history of, of 1G through 5G. So broadband, or I should say cell phones and towers came about in 1996. That was 1G and, and that technology is no longer in use because we moved up to 2G, 3G, and 4G, which are currently in use. Um, so we have low orbit satellites, a small number of them. I think there's something on the order of 5,000 satellites around the world these days. Uh, but they do more than that. There's global positioning satellites, et cetera. 2G. In 2001, we had the beginning of Wi-Fi, uh, known as the third generation, 3G. 2007, the smartphone. This was a big breakthrough. And now, of course, it's the main communication device that seven billion strong on Earth in a world that's not quite eight billion people. So that's almost one phone per person. And coming to you soon, starting already this year, 2019, 5G. With faster download speeds, if you hear the ads for it, self-driving cars or autonomous vehicles, virtual and augmented reality at a flash, and the Internet of Things whereby all of our appliance and many things that we own will be hooked up to the smart grid and possibly used for surveillance of us. So here are the frequency bands allocated in the United States 
And these are, uh, who controls that is the Federal Communications Commission or the FCC. It's a little organization of about six people in Washington and among them are, they're mostly businessmen and um, industrial people who've come from the telecom industry who now sit in office, but uh, there's not among them a scientist nor is there a physician or anyone in healthcare. And yet this organization is making the rules now about our exposure and uh, allocating these frequencies, which were, by the way, previously used largely for radar. And this one uh, used for military weapon known as the active denial uh, weapon. What does this do? The military will use this for crowd control or maybe in a war to make a crowd dissipate and it burns the skin, and they feel like their skin is on fire and they run. So that's the high end of 5G, and they're not quite all licensed to different companies like Verizon and AT&T and T-Mobile, but they will be shortly. And so they run from sub uh, six gigahertz or 600 megahertz up to the gigahertz range. And down here in megahertz, we have the microwaves, and up here we have the so-called millimeter waves, waves that have wavelengths that are on the order of a millimeter. And so that's what 5G is about. It's about, first of all, an intensification or densification of 4G antennas in our environment, such as our residential areas and schools. And then uh, with a flip of a switch, they can go right to 5G frequencies. So just a software difference with all the new antennas that they'll be positioning in our environment. So what is the infrastructure on Earth? Um, many of you have probably seen a thick black cable that was now put between telephone poles in your residential areas. This came to California about a year and a half ago where I live. It's the fattest cable and the lowest cable on our telephone poles. And a cross section of that looks like this. It's fiber optics. And that's a very good thing because if you have light traveling in pipes, it's completely safe. But that's not all there is to 5G. We would love it if somehow they would extend the fiber optics to our homes. But no, they're planning to give us wireless from the poles right outside of our homes. Uh, we'd be blasted with a, a Wi-Fi component of those frequencies consisting of 5G frequencies. And the antennas that would be put on the telephone poles will have a circular shroud around them like this. In some places, these have already been installed uh, initially, kind of experimentally, for example, Sacramento, California, parts of uh, Minneapolis. I saw some in Italy. I was there in Florence just a, a few weeks ago. And they're going to have power supplies that look very much like our mailboxes, uh, some of which will be installed on the ground in public rights of way or on our easements of our homes, and some of which will be installed right under the antenna array. They're rather heavy, but they're planning to raise them up because people don't like the looks of them on their land. So uh, millions of new antennas, they expect them to be installed every 1,000 feet uh, in our residential areas and schools. And with it will come more 4G in addition to the new 5G frequencies. But wait, there's more. Now they're expecting 42,000. The earlier figure was 20,000, but the updated figure is just from a week ago is now 42,000 5G satellites launched into lower Earth orbit, covering every square inch of the planet as shown here with frequency so that we'll have a truly wireless worldwide web everywhere on Earth. There will be no so-called white zone where you can escape if you happen to be sensitive to this. This is problematic, I think. And who are the companies launching these satellites? SpaceX, which is Elon Musk's firm, one of his firms, a company called OneWeb, uh, you can go to their website and, and they'll say, Every, no matter where you are, we will cover you. They're very proud of this. And Amazon, those are the three companies that will be launching these antennas. Already, the FCC has approved 12,000, and uh, some of them have already been launched. I don't know if they've turned them on yet, but any day now. If you were around in the 50s, you may remember the launching of the Sputnik. That was the first satellite on Earth, and it was really a breakthrough. Uh, 1957. As of 1993, we've already had thousands of satellites, global positioning, and, and otherwise some for 4G. And now in uh, 2018, that's how it looks from space, and we're going to have 42,000 more satellites. There's a lot of environmental concerns about this, what happens when you keep poking holes in the ionosphere in terms of global climate change or 
or other aspects of planet Earth, the sensitive fields of Earth that protect life, that resonate with life. So there's a race for 5G. The current administration in Washington sees it as competition with China. Now, the Huawei company is the Chinese, one of the largest telecom companies in the world. They took in about $500 billion equivalent in business last year. And they also make chipsets for the 5G technology. And it's going to be cheaper than chipsets made in the United States. And so I know there's a war, war on whether we should be using Huawei chipsets because some people are concerned that the Chinese may then spy on us or the world. But they, they already have this out. I've been in China several times over the last few months. And I have to tell you that China is way ahead of us with 5G. So the race has been lost. And many countries are signing up with Huawei for uh, their technology to be inserted in their latest 5G phones and antennas and all other equipment. So um, there, there is a fast track nonetheless because um, uh, our government wants this uh, because whoever takes on 5G is they, they feel it will bring a, quite a boost to the economy, if not more world dominance. So that's what's happening. We have some interesting laws on the books that I, I found out about why we were not allowed to speak about health concerns in our local government meetings. Because I went and spoke to the city of Oakland, California, concerned about health. I said, you know, local government should be involved here. And they shook their heads and said, sorry, we don't have any jurisdiction over that. And I, I'm puzzled. I said, but why? And then I found out about this law that Clinton signed in 1996, the very beginning of Wi-Fi. Who would have thought the telecom industry pushed probably through lobbyists and legislators who were greased with campaign monies from big telecom, a law that totally indemnifies them from anything related to health and makes it illegal for, lo for local governments, state, community, county, to talk about health in relationship to telecom installations. That's what's on the books, folks. So what can we do about this? Seems we have to go to the federal level. And then we had a ruling in 2018, the FCC makes dictums, I don't know how legal these are, they've been contested, that says the federal government is complete control of 5G and the local governments just have to move it out in the so-called fast track, which means they don't even have time to review the antenna permit applications that come into city planning. You know, they've decided where these things go to have full coverage. They've checked it out via meters and things and so, it's hard to say where they're going to be, but they're going to be on telephone poles and maybe street lights, and they've got a grid planned out in our neighborhoods. And, you know, if one happens to be in front of a school, you think there would be city review, but they can't talk about health. They can talk about the color, the form, and shape. How irrelevant is that? I've sat in these meetings, and I, sat, I scratched my head and said, I can't come here anymore. I can't come to these meetings and talk about trivia when there are big issues as you'll see, but that's what's going on. The federal government is in complete control of the rollout and the local communities have very little input except art artistic. And a little bit about location with respect to maybe a car running into the installation. So, so FCC mandated um, the so-called shot clock, 60 to 90 day, that was already earlier this year that local governments just had to approve it so it became a rubber stamp operation without really reading the permit applications. And most of them say 4G, but it's very dubious because it's really 4G plus 5G and they're just gonna roll it all out on one antenna that has a software switch where they can do both really. And there will be no government environmental review of the 5G even though we have a law in the books. The National Environment Policy Act, so-called NEPA of 1969, Nobody seems to remember this law except, of course, the Native Americans who invoked it in a recent lawsuit and won a case in a district court of appeals in D.C. They were able to protect their sacred lands. They won the case. Now, it can only go to the Supreme Court to undo it if, if the industry decides to take them there. But I'm happy to say they hung together as many nations that they are. Uh, the natives, and they won the case and they will not have antennas on their land. Now they will still have satellites because the satellites are going to be everywhere. That remains to be seen. There are other 
other lawsuits going on as well, trying to undermine some of these things. And cities have sued the federal government, and all of these lawsuits are in various stages, and I don't have an update on them. But nonetheless, next year is the target date for 5G rollout, and I feel very motivated to bring the message to people that there are serious health consequences from the 5G planned as indicated with a lot of wireless, with so many satellites blasting the earth, and no environmental review uh, or impact report on all of this. You would think it should be done. And so that means everything will be changed. There will be 5G antennas also turning out 4G frequencies, 5G satellites, 5G routers, and 5G smartphones. And then, of course, the smart appliances that you'll begin to find on the market, if not already, will be imbued with um, also signals that will go to your smart meter and enter into the smart grid so that we'll have this internet of things whereby just about every appliance uh, and device that you own will be hooked in somehow and monitored, if not controlled by the grid. So 5G is really different. It's a very, it's a quantum jump above 4G, 3G, and 2G because total coverage of the earth is planned without any white zones, millions of antennas, thousands of satellites blasting us with 5G frequencies and moving focus beams of higher power. I have a little video to show you. Oh, we didn't check the sound. We'll see how that works. And the higher frequency millimeter waves that have been used by the US military for radar and weapon purposes that um, have quite a literature showing effects of radar waves, especially on military men and women that are not healthy. And that goes back to the 1970s. And that's short-term exposure. Now we're talking about exposure 24-7, 365 for the rest of our lives. Because nobody's going to turn this thing off once it's on. And we don't have any meter that measures, at least a people's meter doesn't exist, that measures the higher frequencies of 5G. If you want to measure this, you have to pay about $150,000 for a military-grade instrument to measure these higher millimeter waves. It's very complex and you need training to operate that. And I don't see that our cities and local governments are going to take control of measuring whether we're still within safety guidelines either. So that's a problem. And it's different in terms of broadcasting. Broadcasting means casting broad waves. In other words, like drop a stone in water and see how the waves move out and make an arc, or even if not a circle. And that's how 4G, 2G, and 3G work. But 5G is very different. It's like focused laser beams coming out for an instant, or even uh, a milli, uh, say a thousandth of a second, and then going somewhere else. And, and it's very strong because they're focused localized beams going out pencil thin, sort of like a laser, even though it's not coherent. So that's called beam forming. So we leave broadcasting behind. That's old technology. And we move up to beam forming with more powerful focused beams Ever shooting out of these antennas into our devices and possibly through our bodies into our devices. So they have both near field um, and far field uh, features and if, if the beam is going in this direction there are also side lobes so you have to be concerned about other directions as well and they'll be much more intense in along the beam. And I think my next slide, let's see if I can get some sound out of this. All right, I'll just get to the point where I show you the beams. Sorry about that. So here's the station, and there are all the users. And now you're going to see beams going out, flashing just for a short time, then another user. And it's constantly going to be moving around like that. OK, you get the idea. All right, so that's from the industry, that video. Um, sorry about the sound. Now, people ask. What is the natural background of microwaves or millimeter waves on Earth? It's zero. In other words, what reaches us from outer space and the sun, we don't get any microwaves or millimeter waves. Earth evolved, life evolved on Earth or came to Earth, and, and we've never seen a background of microwaves or millimeter waves. It's just not part of uh, what reaches the Earth. So we're going from essentially zero. This is nature. Um, with extremely small values, 1.8 picowatts per meter squared, up to values, for example, in San Francisco, California, about minus 35 or 180 microwatts per meter squared. So 
according to the bio biologists, the building biologists who uh, have really established safety issues for uh, our living situation, this is already above a severe anomaly compared to nature. And it's, um, as you can see, 10 million times above nature. That's already what we've got. If we just stand outside in San Francisco and hold a microwave meter, we're measuring 10 million times over nature. That's our streets. And inside our homes, it gets into values like this in offices and uh, near instruments, like near your cell phone turned on. You get into extreme anomalies. And our actual standards are up here. In other words, we're still below what the FCC has set as guidelines. We don't have any safety standards anywhere in the world. We only have so-called guidelines because they know that it's not safe. And no insurance company, by the way, will insure any of these uh, internet, uh, excuse me, the Wi-Fi providers. It's, they just know uh, that is problematic. So here's our limit, and it's based on the idea of tissue heating. What does that mean? That means that at FCC or in the industry, they have this little mannequin, a head and shoulders, looking like a human, and they fill it with salt water, saline. And then they strap a cell phone on what would be the head, and they put a thermometer inside the salt water. And they're looking to see, does the salt water heat up in short term? And if it doesn't, then that's considered safe. That's the so-called thermal limit. And we're, we're, we've got to be below that in order to be safe. So here is the limit in the United States and Canada. Now, you'll notice some other countries have much lower limits of exposure. And China, Russia, and Switzerland, they know more because they also look beyond thermal effects, they're looking at so-called non-thermal effects. And what that means is that, first of all, the waves coming to us are not continuous. They're not even sine waves, but because they're digital, they go on and off with huge peaks, and then they're off, and then another bunch of huge peaks, and then off. And what our government is looking at is the average, the average of all those peaks. OK, let me give you an analogy. If I go to the light switch and I go, ding, 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 ding. And then you're going to say, stop. I, I can't take it. Uh, make it steady. Uh, OK, that's what we've got with digital frequencies. And then you would say, well, I'm going to tell you the average value of that light intensity was really low. It's not a problem. So that's what our government, that's the tricky, trickery and the, the hijacking of science that was done in order to say we go by thermal effects, but we don't look at any wave train. The train of waves is what an organism receives and cannot adapt to. No living thing can adapt to a wave train that is a sequence of sharp pulses followed by nothing and, and for the rest of their lives. That's what we're talking about here. That's what wireless digital frequencies are. They're on and off very sharp frequencies. And they're trying to say, well, the average value is low, and it doesn't heat you, so don't worry about it. But there are non-thermal effects on living things from this rapid uh, pulsation of digital waves. And that's what they're totally ignoring. And there's a body of literature. Uh, a lot of it was done in Russia, by the way, and that's why their standards are much lower. Eastern Europe has adopted the Russian standards, and I think China, the neighbor, also. And Switzerland is always into safety. So that's where it stands. Um, so the electromagnetic spectrum is the spectrum of all radiant energies, not sound, but radiant energies such as light, visible light, infrared, ultraviolet. And then we get down into the lower frequencies. Uh, here are the radio waves, and among them microwaves. And just above that is millimeter waves here. Terahertz is the stuff used in the airport where they make you stand like this for the scanner. And then up here, we know these waves, the ionizing radiation, cause severe biological damage. And we cover people with lead when we take dental x-rays. And we say, caution with ultraviolet. Here's our visible waves that are good and healthy. And infrared has some medical benefits. And then we get into these waves. And it turns out they do also produce free radicals in the body, ions just as well, even though they're largely called the non-ionizing part of the spectrum. So here's a little bit about digital versus analog. Uh, so we're talking about, for 5G, discrete frequencies that will be going on and off very rapidly on the order of, let's say, microseconds, millisecond pulses. And it will be pulsed. 
and its radio frequency. And our biology, we're analog beings used to continuous energies that we can adapt to, and like sunlight uh, that is slowly changing over, over the hours. And here's the spectrum. It's broad spectrum with kind of a peak in the green, and it runs from uh, far infrared to uh, ultraviolet. And that's what life is used to and needs for health. So it's a very different signature to these waves. This is a map of, of all of the radio frequency spectrum, and I'm just showing it to you to impress you how much uh, the FCC has already divided it up and given it to various companies and military installations and in the little bit blow up. Here's um, a blow up of the part where 5G frequency bands come in, which are shown in red. You see how many there are. There are quite a number of them. That also makes it different from f uh, 4G where you had 900 megahertz for cell phones and you had 2.4 uh, gigahertz for Wi-Fi. Now we've got a ton of different frequencies. And by the way, 2.4 gigahertz for Wi-Fi is the same frequency used in microwave ovens. It can't be healthy for us, you know? It, it, it heats water, and we're water beings. So what are we doing blasting the earth with that? So this is a common scene. We see, unfortunately, children and some adults really strapped to their cell phones. And by the way, the cell phone is the thing you have most control over, and it will still be your greatest exposure problem with 5G. That and your own Wi-Fi modem, if you choose to have one. So you have control over these devices, as I'll explain in the end. And what happens when you put a cell phone to your head? Well, I've seen some electroencephalograms, some brainwave patterns that show that it looks like an electromagnetic storm. Not in everyone, but in some people. In some people, it looks a little bit more like epilepsy. It looks abnormal. And what happens if you do this over and over again is that you start training your nervous system to make that pattern, which is not healthy. Anytime you depart from coherence in the physiology and, and move into incoherence, it's a stressor. You're on the road towards something chronic, a chronic breakdown. But one thing we do know is that young children have much thinner skulls, half a millimeter skull in a five-year-old, one millimeter thick skull in a 10-year-old, two millimeter thick skull in an adult. So the penetration of, of these waves, whether microwaves uh, or to some extent millimeter waves, will be much greater in the brains of children. And we should be very concerned about that because children are the most susceptible. They're still developing. They have a lot to go in terms of development of that nervous system. And their, their development may be thwarted by this kind of stressor, especially rep rep repetitively used. I mean, they're going uh, with Wi-Fi in schools, as you probably know, and in kindergarten with things like tablets. They're not getting reading uh, picture books anymore. They're getting a tablet with Wi-Fi. And that's right in front of their nose. And I'm very concerned about that. I think we should all be. Um, thermal effects are really small, but you can see that in thermography that the head heats up, and I know the government has now called the ear an appendage. It's no longer part of your head. So it's okay if your ear gets hot, even though there's a, a burst of acoustic neuromas as a result of cell phone use, a type of tumor right there under the external ear. Here's something that I'm really concerned about besides uh, tissue heating, and one of the worst non-thermal effects is damage to the blood-brain barrier. So. It's been shown with animals, certainly, that if you hold a cell phone near an animal uh, within about 10 minutes and within 10 minutes of making a call, the blood-brain barrier, uh, which is normally keep excluding certain chemicals from entering the brain, breaks down and things get into the brain that normally don't get into the brain. And we could think about this in relationship to the vaccination schedule and some of the elements in vaccines like mercury and aluminum preservatives and adjuvants that are pro-inflammatory. And also, um, besides vaccines, we have agrochemicals like glyphosate, uh, now found in most adults, reported in the JAMA, that it's excreted in urine of most adults. Uh, so we have a problem then with also the possibility of getting toxins in the brain, and especially in developing organisms like children. What is this going to do? Is this behind some of the maladies of our times, like the rise in autism, the rise in learning dis disabilities like ADD, ADHD, and other neurological diseases. Uh, we don't really know. One of the things that's tricky to finger point and say this causes this directly because we do have a number of things in our environment. We have chemical toxins, we have 
electromagnetic, and it's really a synergy, I think, that's playing havoc with our health. So as I said earlier, we don't have safety standards in the United States, we only have guidelines, and if you want to read more about this and hear it from an expert, I recommend the YouTube videos of Dr. Barry Trower, T-R-O-W-E-R. He worked for microwave weapons in the UK. He's retired. He has a lot to say about this question. And there is no uh, one size fits all because we're all different, different ages, different years of exposure. One thing that's clear is that the exposure is cumulative, just as with X-ray doses and radioactivity doses. Doses of radio frequency can build um, problems within your body due to the buildup of free radicals and other damage to DNA, et cetera. So we don't even know our dosage. Nobody's wearing a dosimeter. There's one dosimeter that I found in the market. It's German and it costs about $3,000. And we put the dosimeter, which we obtained on a child going to school in Davis, California, and found that the exposure of this child was already over the guideline. Well, they had industrial strength Wi-Fi in the school. The, the child had a tablet with Wi-Fi and also a cell phone. And that's what happened. So who's monitoring our youth? Uh, it doesn't seem to be happening. It's also very difficult to adapt, as I said, to pulse digital signals. And where do people carry the phones? Very often they carry it right next to major organs, like in their pockets, near the heart. I've seen women put it in the bra. When the phone is on, this is dangerous because it's really blasting the body. It's also against the manual of the phones. If you can find a manual associated with your cell phone, it will say for sure, keep it an inch from your body. And yet nobody reads these manuals. They're not paper manuals, and you have to find them in the bowels of your cell phone. Good luck. So, um, so anyway, this, the notion of a guideline, what, what's safe for whom, when, is a complex question with no consensus except that the government has drawn a line that the industry has told them to do. So we see often people like this, pregnant women with their wireless device and children playing with wireless devices, and it's not safe. So this is the official view. Um, the specific absorption rate based on this thermal effect is, in the United States, 1.6 watts per kilogram of tissue, and there's no scientists or medical doctors who were ever involved in making that decision. By the way, the FCC recently reviewed for six years what's going to be the guideline for 5G. They said we're sticking to the same guideline, no change. And they stick to the same premise that it's only thermal effects. So no non-thermal will ever be considered, uh, despite what other countries do. So uh, as I said earlier, the Russian guidelines, the Chinese guidelines, and Austria is much lower. And insurance companies do not insure providers due to health risks. So here are the, some of the health effects of wireless due to non-thermal effects. There's really a lot of different things because it works through this free radical chemistry, through um, promoting the formation of free radicals, exacerbating the formation of things like superoxide and then superoxide dismutase and uh, other enzymes try to correct it. They're also raised not only in humans but also in plants. There's studies on plants that show the same kind of chemistry changes uh, so the, those of you doing agriculture can think about this. And, and the very things we eat, we're going to see more free radical chemistry. So DNA damage, mutations, altered gene expression, reduced sperm count and fertility. We never had fertility clinics for my generation, and now they seem to be everywhere. Detrimental effects on fetal and child development. Some of these studies are generalized from animal, controlled animal studies. Neurological changes, including brain degeneration and cognitive impairment, learning and memory deficits. Here, the oxidative stress is at the root of all of this, so that's the free radical chemistry. And the movement toward reactive oxygen species, in particular, and away from free electrons. Cardiovascular disease, starting with palpitations, leading onward to arrhythmias and other problems. Metabolic and immune system dysfunction eye and skin damage, and we can expect more skin damage from 5G because the frequencies uh, are really, many of them absorbed by the skin. And the World Health Organization classifies uh, Wi-Fi as a class 2B human carcinogen. That's not a high level, but we do see, and they have admitted, that there are more brain cancers, gliomas, which are really very dangerous brain cancers that almost nobody survives from, and acoustic neuromas. So. The non-thermal effects are really well established. There are thousands of papers. 
in peer-reviewed science and medicine, some of which were unclassified U.S. military studies. Here are some websites, two websites where you can find numerous references. Um, the so-called Bioinitiative Report, which has 1,800 references, and also another report from Europe, but it's accessible through our PubMed gateway to the National Library of Medicine. There's also the older Glazer Report. This was uh, from the military, looking back at radar and seeing effects on uh, humans from radar exposure, and men could not function very well back in 1971. Recently, they took this down. It was available online. It's gone. If you want it, I can give it to you. So one possible mechanism by which microwaves damage our body was given voice in recent years by Dr. Martin Paul, and he has offered a free ebook on this that, that it's uh, shifting calcium from outside the cell inside, opening so-called channels in the cell membrane, whereby calcium, an important second messenger, an important regulator inside the cell, is getting in and then playing havoc with many biochemical reactions because calcium does this. And so then there would be multiple effects all the way from the epigenetic level up through um, behavioral effects on people. Now, there is, uh, I would say, a growing number of people who are electrosensitive. And I noticed this especially after smart meters were introduced into California about seven years ago. Suddenly, I had a slew of clients who didn't know what to do, couldn't sleep in their own homes, uh, really were bent out of shape from uh, uh, these symptoms, uh, or some of these symptoms, headaches, anxiety, irritability, sleep problems, restlessness, brain fog, difficulty concentrating, memory problems, ringing in the ears or tinnitus, heart palpitations and arrhythmias, depression, fatigue, and there are others. Uh, one or more of those can, can, you can consider yourself electrosensitive. I was, and I didn't know it, I had bought a desktop computer which came with a wireless mouse and keyboard. We still have the old DSL Ethernet at my house and lab, but sitting at this computer for hours, I was getting exposed through the wireless mouse and keyboard and started to get heart palpitations after long sits. And when I returned to wired keyboard and wired mouse, this dissipated. So I myself saw firsthand how this is so. And you might consider reducing your own exposure. Um, there's an interesting report by Blue Cross Blue Shield that reviewed the health of the millennium generation, people born between 1980 and 2000. A rather large uh, number, I think it was hundreds of thousands of millennials were studied. They were the first generation to really grow up using wireless and they use it heavily, as you know. And I'm not putting the blame on them when I show this data, except to say that we have to be concerned because they are the least healthy generation that has ever been seen in our country. Starting at age 27, a sharp decline in their health. And these are just some of the things over recent years that have occurred. Um, increase in chronic problems between 2014 and 17, with depression up 31%, hyperactivity up 29%, type 2 diabetes up 22%, hypertension, high blood pressure up 16%. Ages 30 to 36 had 21% more cardiovascular conditions, 15% had more endocrine conditions in 2017 than three years ago. And it's possible that wireless is a strong factor in this. I'm not saying it's the only factor, because their exposure to agrochemicals and maybe the vaccine schedule was also different than previous generations, with numerous more vaccines, again, more toxins and preservatives in those vaccines. But this is a scathing report, and, and we need to take this seriously to uh, turn things around for this generation and subsequent ones. Now I want to tell you about a pilot study I did on 4G, and my research question was this. Is the blood affected by short-term exposure to a smartphone? I did this a few years ago when, uh, with a single smartphone, and it was funded by the Weston A. Price Foundation, which was interested to find out whether their particular diet, which is a very good diet in my view, the diet of our ancestors with organic vegetables and fruits and um, uh, free-range pastured meats and fish and raw milk and raw cheeses and kind of low on bread and uh, wheat. Um, part of the study was to find out whether that study might be protective if there is an effect on the blood. 
So I selected adults who are normally normal and healthy and eating this good diet because most people eating uh, a corrupt diet, their blood doesn't look too good to start with. So uh, the blood of Weston A. Price Foundation people looks very good. And I had people on the diet, maybe 20% on the diet all the way to 100% in a range in age from about 21 to 75 in this study. So uh, I took the blooded baseline. They came in, fasted without using uh, any wireless for four hours and fasted five hours. And then I took a sample of blood, viewed it under the microscope, photographed it. Then I had them wear a backpack with the, uh, the smartphone turned on, ready to receive a call or text, but it didn't. It just was on in a backpack for 45 minutes. Then I took another blood sample, the so-called carrying condition. And then finally I had them work with the cell phone uh, going on the internet and two five-minute phone calls holding the phone near the head for 45 more minutes and we looked at the blood and that's called the use condition. And I used dark field microscope, there's the system, um, and it's hooked up to a video camera and we can all view the blood here and take photographs and videos. So finger pricks and toe pricks were used because one could argue if the cell phone is held in the hand then maybe only the hand shows the effect so I also did some toe pricks uh, because that's about as far away from the finger as you can get. So here's normal healthy blood. Um, you can see it's lit from the side under dark fields. So the red blood cells are round and uniform. And then this white blood cell caught in the active motion is kind of moving toward 2 o'clock. And the plasma is pretty free of debris or clotting, early clotting. That's a rare view to see blood this good in recent years. Most people's blood is quite corrupt for various reasons. So here's a 75-year-old woman. Their blood isn't perfect. There's some stickiness and a little bit of early fibrin in the plasma. <clears throat> and after carrying the phone for 45 minutes, we see all of, virtually all of the red blood cells are stuck together in what are called rouleaux. Rouleau means rolls in French, like looking at a roll of nickels on side, on the edge. So this is very bad for microcirculation because the red blood cells have to go single-handedly through the microcapillaries to deliver oxygen and pick up uh, carbon dioxide and bring nutrition. So when you have blood like this, you would, might feel tired, low energy, cold hands and feet. Uh, and then this is the picture after using the phone for 45 minutes after this. Uh, now all the rouleau broke and you can see the bottle cap shape of the cells which makes me think that Marvin, pa Marvin Paul's idea that membrane damage followed by leakage into, with calcium inside may be part of the mechanism here. And these, these are actually spikes sticking out of the cells. So these cells are like little sea urchins, kind of spiky, and they're called echinocytes in hematology. So this is the blood picture following uh, phone use for just like you would do in the airport, you know, 45 minutes holding the phone then 45 minutes using the phone. Here's another case, uh, male 55, blood initially looks very good. Uh, carrying the phone, the blood got sticky, not quite rouleau, but overlapping uh, sticky blood. The cells are now losing their charge that normally keeps them repelling one another. And the bottle caps are profound in this case. The younger people had less intense effects, but everyone over 50 had profound blood changes. So the results from the study, I won't go into it in detail. You can read it on my website, brubic.com. You can click on publications and read this. Nine out of 10 subjects showed unhealthy blood changes following cell phone exposure. The red blood cells first aggregate and then further exposure, they, the aggregates seem to break down and, and the cells uh, change shape and become spiky. And that's not a good cell, according to hematologists. So we didn't find any protective effect of the Weston A. Price Foundation recommended diet. People on 100% of that diet showed the same damage, I'm sorry to say. Uh, so it, apparently diet alone is not going to save us from this fate. So we are energy beings. Um, we operate electromagnetically. We have a lot of electricity, uh, electric fields governing things, not just our nervous systems and our heart, but but uh, charges moving in our blood and lymph and literally everywhere in biochemistry. So we are sensitive to energy from other beings, from technology, from the environment. And it's clear to me that unnatural frequencies aggravate us, shift our physiology and, and play havoc with us. 
And I also uh, have been studying the biofield for a long time, and these are some examples of what happens with electrosensitive persons. This is someone who came to me and said, I no longer can use my computer and Wi-Fi. I really get sick. I don't know what to do. I, my job depends on it. So I said, well, come bring your notebook computer, but don't use it for a while, and just bring it in, and then I'll look at you before and after. And these uh, images were made with a gas discharge visualization camera. It's a camera similar to Curlian photography, where you measure the light images coming out of each fingertip um, one finger at a time, and then there's a software that makes a composite biofield based on meridians and uh, some empirical data that the Russians have gathered. This is a Russian device. And so initially, her biofield looked pretty good. It's pretty solid. There's no gaps. But following one hour of working at the computer, sitting at a desk in my office, you see how disheveled this biofield has become. So uh, looking at this and a number of other cases, I can say that the energy field, especially of electrosensitive people, becomes corrupt after uh, exposure to wireless, especially 45 minutes to an hour. And often it shows an imbalance right left. Even in people who are not electrosensitive, the biofield gets skewed right to left. And here's a more typical case of someone who's not electrosensitive. Initially, biofield looks like this. This is done with the BioWell device. And following uh, some exposure, in this case 30 minutes, you can see this spiky fractal image and some gaps. And this is the picture of stress. Uh, we see with chronic stress, these kinds of changes in the biofield. So there are environmental facts. I gave a lengthy lecture on this yesterday that was uh, three hours. And in there, I really focused heavily on the environment, on all the papers in the environment, largely on laboratory experiments. There's less on field effects because it's really harder to study. But it's kind of the same chemistry in the same situation with plants. Tomato plants show more stress-related biochemicals, just as humans do with these free radical chemistries that come up. Uh, it's possible that um, the collapse in the insect population, and especially among bees, may be in part due to Wi-Fi. Uh, Wi-Fi exposed to a hive, the bees first disappear, and then they seem to miss flowers, their, their behavior, their smell, sense of smell, and learning ability is affected. And there's one study that I read on microbial cultures that showed listeria, which is a known pathogen, and pathogenic E. coli, not all the strains are healthy, uh, grew enormously strong and ver more virulent in the presence of cell phone or Wi-Fi. And also uh, messed with antibiotic resistance, so they became more resistant to antibiotics. Not good things. So uh, you can follow that other 93-hour uh, lecture that I gave uh, yesterday if you want to learn more about the environment. Now, I'm not the only scientist uh, speaking out against these things. There's a lot of people, healthcare workers, scientists, and the growing public that is becoming aware. And we need to come together to voice what we would like before this is deployed. And that's the word they use. And I know that's a word of weapons. And maybe that says something more. They don't use the word installation. They use the word deployment, as they do in the military. A very interesting choice. But these are some key websites. This one here, www.5gappeal.eu. And uh, it's an international appeal launched by a group of scientists and physicians. And you can also sign. There is a moratorium on, in certain cities. They've said no. And they said, unless you prove it's safe, we don't want it. And there's a growing number of cities trying to do this. In Brussels, the mayor of Brussels came out publicly. You can watch a YouTube video where she says, not here, show me it's safe. Parts of Switzerland, certain cantons, and Rome and Germany also have come out. Not all of these places, but sections are coming out. And I was recently in Italy making a speech to the Italian government on this. They're considering it an issue for their upcoming election. We have a number of federal lawsuits trying to stop 5G or put a moratorium on it, citing that, first of all, the FCC doesn't have this kind of jurisdiction over us to make these fast tracks and uh, all of these rules. The Santa Fe Alliance for Public Health and Safety is one such group. And there are many cities across the United States that have also sued the federal government. The issue is when you sue the federal government and you say you win in court, you don't win any money. 
So where do we get the money to pay the lawyers? That's a problem. Uh, they have to almost do it pro bono or somebody has to come up with money to pay them. And cities in California, Mill Valley, in the San Francisco Bay, San Jose, which is really Silicon Valley, also doesn't want 5G. Interesting. They may know something. And uh, OK, the 5GSpaceAppeal.org is a group, and I encourage you to go to this website and sign, stopping 5G in space as well. So just recently, uh, 172,395 signatures were put on that website by 204 countries and territories, people in those places, including over 4,500 scientists by now, 8,000 engineers, and over 22,000 medical doctors and other healthcare workers. So join the growing trend that we need to do something about this, and I encourage you to sign it. Doesn't cost anything, just takes you a minute. There are some extreme views on 5G. Let me see what I'm doing for time. Um, among them, here they are on some associated websites. Um, I'm not going to take a stand on these. You can ask me personally what I think, but um, these are various views that uh, people espouse. Uh, what is this really all about? Uh, how many people really want this? Do we really need self-driving cars? I mean, all of those things that I showed you, except for self-driving cars, could be achieved with a totally wired 5G done with fiber optics. But the minute you have self-driving cars, then you can't be wired, <laughs> obviously. So then you need it. But what do we really need this for other than that? And do we really need self-driving cars? Or maybe we can do that another way, maybe with uh, blinking LED lights on the backside of cars or something. Uh, so one idea is that this is really about total surveillance of us. And it certainly will involve that, because if everything you own is hooked up to the smart grid, and it will know when that appliance is on or off, and exactly what you're doing and where you are is already known. And every little email that you do through your wire, wire, wireless devices is, can be captured by various organizations. So that's one idea. And in China, it is a total surveillance state. Uh, you can really see it, how that is over there. Uh, facial recognition, cameras, and, and um, people adapt to it by wearing masks. And uh, that's not just worn for their colds. It seems clear in Hong Kong now. So the second item here is artificial intelligence takeover. Some people think, uh, who's really behind this and how is that working? Um, Stephen Hawking said before he passed, AI could spell the end of the human race. He was concerned. Not everybody is. Uh, AI is definitely being highly developed here and there and is receiving a lot of funding from Wall Street and other places. Third on this agenda is a depopulation agenda. One thing that was found in mice studies is that mice, mice either kept near a cell phone or near a Wi-Fi modem uh, showed less and less offspring. And by the fourth generation, they were totally sterile. And that was irreversible. They couldn't see how you can go beyond that. So when we reduce sperm count and, and possibly the fertility of eggs in young girls with these devices around schools and in kindergarten, I think we can only expect uh, definitely less population, if not depopulation. Targeted individuals, there are people who claim that they're being attacked by some kind of energy-directed weapon and they don't feel right, and they can't pinpoint it, but it's sometimes voices in the head. And there is some precedence for understanding that because um, Dr. Alan Fry, for example, some 40 years ago showed that if you blast microwaves on the temporal lobes, people may hear voices in their head. They hear sounds. Now, electromagnetic fields really shouldn't activate your ears, uh, but they activate the temporal lobe. And then that signal can be modulated and make you sound, uh, feel as if you're hearing voices in your head. So that may be part of it. It might be a modulated microwave signal blasting on the temporal lobes. The next item here is directed energy weapon. And I already mentioned the 95 gigahertz being identical with the military weapon for crowd control. And the last is um, possibly, this is really extreme, an extinction level event. And if you're interested in watching a movie on this, I recommend a movie by Sasha Stone called 5G Apocalypse, The Extinction Event. It's free and available online. So now, the last part of my talk is uh, 
giving you the positive side. What can we do about this? How can we stay healthy now that you've heard some of the evidence and some of the dire political scene under which we currently sit? So some strategies to stay healthy, first the broad outline and then delving individually. <clears throat> For one thing, I think it's important to measure the levels, especially where you spend a lot of your time, in bed and in your workplace, at your desk, where you have your computer, et cetera. Certainly don't have a Wi-Fi modem in the same room where you work or sleep. Put it as far away as possible. Better yet, get rid of your Wi-Fi modem. Go back to Ethernet DSL. Remember the old plug-in? Looks like a phone cord. It's faster, it's safer, it's more secure, and nobody can hack into your wired system. They sold us uh, quite a line to get us involved in wireless along the line. They said it was faster. It isn't. My, wire, my wired line is faster than any hotel, any, any, any institute that I've ever stepped in that has wireless. It's much slower. So um, know your levels. There, there's 4G meters. I recommend the Cornet, C-O-R-N-E-T which is about $180. Uh, that is a handheld meter with batteries where you can easily measure levels. And it will show you with a red LED when you're in a danger zone, a yellow LED when you're kind of middling, a green LED when it's really safe, according to the FCC guidelines. Secondly, you can, oh, I should mention, we're working on a 5G meter because there is nothing for the people that's coming. And we should reduce our exposure to wireless. We can turn our phones on airplane mode. That's the safest mode. And keep it on most of the time. And then we want to see who, who called, who texted, who sent a communication. We can easily touch of a button, turn off airplane mode. And then we can store it safely back in airplane mode in our pocket because it becomes like a brick. It doesn't emit anything on airplane mode. If you turn your cell phone off, However, it still communicates with the GPS satellite, so it's not really off. In addition to airplane mode, you need to turn off the Wi-Fi component if you're using your phone as a Wi-Fi device. So you need to do airplane mode and turn off the Wi-Fi. And then your phone is a brick, safe to hold, safe to carry, but it's not going to make a bleep with respect to a signal coming in, because it doesn't have any. <laughs> but it's a safe way to carry the phone and then turn it on when you're using it. So there are some protective measures. I'll show you a few that I've studied. And grounding or earthing, I, I saw a film. It's coming up maybe tomorrow, or is it now? There's a film coming up right here on earthing, grounding yourself to the earth. There's at least one paper that shows some good results with EMF stress. And I recommend replacing your wireless router with a wired one. And I can send you instructions on even how to take out the wireless component of your router if you want to kill that, uh, give it a lobotomy, so, so to speak. <laughs> so, so here's the cornet meter. Looks like this, and it's really easy to operate. Um, so it's, this is the latest model, about $180, and it will measure 2G, 3G, and 4G, but it doesn't tell you, it only tells you an aggregate signal. You can't separate out and know what you're getting. So it's going to be obsolete soon as we move up to 5G. My partner, Harry Jabs, and I are working on a 5G meter. We really hope to bring this out uh, this next year because we need a people's meter. And uh, so it, it's, it has him very busy working on something where we can delineate also 2G, 3G, 4G, or the various bands at least, and know our exposure. So that's coming, hopefully. And some other things you can do if you are using your cell phone, of course, use a cord, uh, uh, earbuds, and the best thing to use is the air tube. The air tube really pipes sound into your ears and there's nothing electrical then going in. And it's a plastic tube, so it's not acting as an antenna. Even things like these metal eyeglasses are acting as antennas with uh, some of the microwave frequencies. And then my brain is getting more radiated having eyeglasses on. Another one is wired bras, bras with underwires. That wire acts as an antenna, perfect antenna for frequencies. It's almost crazy that they ever introduced that um, because of the exposure and breast cancer and thinking like that. So we can also use computers more frequently than w wireless tablets um, and probably more safely to access your bank accounts, especially if they're wired computers. 
I recommend, again, back to Ethernet DSL. The deck phone is really a problem. That is the wireless landline. Many people have this now because it's very hard to find a wired landline. These things are great emitters. They even emit more than your cell phones. And even when they're not being used, even if you take the phone off the receiver, the little receivers, uh, satellites or the main one, are also broadcasting 4G. Uh, so uh, they, they should go, really. Or you can learn how to get into this, these phones and remove the wireless component. Then they'll operate just like wired landlines. The satellites wouldn't work then. Um, Wireless mouse and keyboard I already mentioned, and just generally getting back to wired whenever possible. So there are some protective measures that you can take. You can use shielding. You can wear shield, uh, shielded clothing. I don't know how effective these things are. I haven't really measured clothes with metallic threads running through them. And then you would put a meter under there and see how much is coming through. But I think they shield you somewhat, and something is better than nothing. So one company that has quite a range of products, it's not mine at all, LessEMF.com sells a variety of products from uh, shielding for the environment, whether it's special paint you can paint your walls with, or a kind of a mosquito netting made of metal uh, threads to put around your bed to protect your sleeping zone from wireless. You could also turn pull the switch on your power, or your wireless box could be on some kind of um, timer where it goes on during the day when you use it and off at night. There are a lot of creative solutions here. So here's some example of some of these things, caps uh, like that. Um, very inexpensive disposable mylar ponchos and mylar tents. And this kind of netting around the bed is more expensive. And then pon uh, hoodies that look quite normal but actually have a lot of silver threads going through them that would add protection. And some of the electrosensitive persons that I know, and I do work with them as clients, um, they have found relief using these clothes and sometimes wrapping just their head with something like this. Or, and there are actually very good looking metallic kind of scarves that are, are attractive. They don't look like electromagnetic shields either that you can buy. Here's something that we became aware of in China, electromagnetic shielded aprons for pregnant women and that thing would go all the way around and really protect the fetus. And I haven't seen this sold in the United States. We became aware of it in China. Although the Chinese government does not take a stand on these, we, we found. So it's just some private companies. Um, so there are some pendants that are on the market that apparently work by not protecting us against the waves, but by boosting the human energy field. And I studied uh, the Q-Link. I have a paper from 2002, and I've done some more recent work on it because Wi-Fi has been so advanced since 2002. It was worthwhile taking another look at this device, a sympathetic resonance technology embedded in the Q-Link. These are subtle energy devices. They don't operate with batteries. There's, they're all passive resonators that somehow boost the energy field of the human, and that shows up in the BioWell or the gas discharge visualization camera. Another one I studied was this one, quantum field technology, Qi Pendant 3. There are others on the market, and I would say buyer beware. A lot of people come and say, see, I've got full protection. See the sticker on the backside of my phone? So therefore, they think they can do this. And then I say, well, show me the study that says you can do that. Show me a peer-reviewed scientific study that has sufficient numbers that really looked at it in a blinded way and shows protection. Most of them are lacking such data. So don't be fooled by marketing data on one or two persons. You have to look more deeply and you have to ask these companies if you're gonna be part of them or distribute these things, say, we want a real scientific study, show us. Pay for it, you know, especially when they charge a lot of money for these things. So something, a study that I did some years ago on a product that unfortunately was pulled off the market is uh, an improvement of heart rate variability, the heart frequencies, when a person turned on an app on a cell phone. The cell phone had a passive app. They, it was not an active app where you actually work something. You just turn on this app, and it runs in the background of your cell phone. But it has to be connected to Wi-Fi or the internet in order to work. And we found improved heart rate variability with a decrease in sympathetic tone. In other words, 
the balance of the autonomic nervous system was improved. That sympathetic parasympathetic ratio. And many people are walking around in a state of sympathetic dominance. We're all in a state of heightened stress, like code orange or worse. Uh, you know, and it's many stressors in our lives. They just add up. And the way stress works, it, it's sort of like the rain barrel. The rain barrel only holds so much water and then a little more, a few more drops and it overflows. And we're all on the edge of overflowing, if not some have already broken down into chronic disease. So we need to reduce stress. And this app, I thought, this was just an app, not a device. I was so excited about it because it really, somehow working in the background passively, improved heart rate variability with some subtle energy frequencies. Now, this gives me great hope, even though this device, this app is no longer on the market. And one of the reasons is they could not find people to market it, the money to market it. Uh, you know, apps come and go, and every day there's more apps out there, and then other ones just kind of sink into oblivion. And unless you're totally marketing an app in a hard way and, and have a clever marketing ruse, it just goes into oblivion, and so then these companies fail. But what this shows is that there are frequencies that are biologically beneficial and can strengthen our biofields and apparently work to improve things like our autonomic nervous system tone. And that's a big deal. And it gives me great hope then that we can reach out and start conducting more research to find out what are the beneficial frequencies in this giant spectrum, the electromagnetic spectrum that we might add to Wi-Fi, that we might add to our technology to help our health. And who's doing this work, by the way? I'd love to do it, and I know a few other scientists who would like to, probably Glenn Ryan is sitting out there, would be interested in it. And there's others that we know, and you know, there's no funding to do this sort of thing. We would like to do this. I'm putting out the word, because I have a nonprofit laboratory, and we need to help people's health. We're not going to remove 4G and probably not going to remove 5G, but we have to stay healthy. So we need to find out what works for whom and when, and what are those protective frequencies, and what kind of devices already exist out there that might be the best. And the single little companies doing these things don't have the money to fund this. And besides, they'd only want their thing funded. We need to compare some of these products, and we need to search for the appropriate beneficial frequencies that work with life. And some of them might be natural things like Schumann resonance, 7.83 hertz, natural frequency of the earth, and it's harmonics, for example. So I put out that word. And I am concerned about all these protected devices out there. Lots of people say, look at this. Isn't this cool? Look what I've got. I'm protected. And I say, really? And then you do this with your phone, you think? You're protected? OK, maybe, but maybe not. We don't see the peer-reviewed publications on a lot of devices. Now, I looked at some devices with my blood bioassay that I showed you. And some I found worked for a while. And then guess what? They stopped working. They got corrupted by the radiation. So that's another thing. What is the lifetime, the useful lifetime of these devices? Does the radiation zap them? In other words, they may be based on some kind of imbued imprinting or memory in a product. And then, as more and more frequencies from Wi-Fi and these technologies impinge upon them, that is corrupt, made corrupt, and then they don't work anymore. So we need to know what works for whom and the, the lifetime of useful use of it in the environment in which we find ourselves. So I only found partial protection. I never found a product so far that gave anybody full protection. And I looked at six. So we need funding for comparative studies and to identify what are the beneficial frequencies that we might uh, bring in. So here's some other things you can do for yourself. You can opt out of a smart meter. And I think this varies state to state or locality to locality. In California, I never got a uh, smart meter. I, I had a long conversation with the Public Utilities Commission about why we don't want these things. And they didn't put one up for me. But many people then later opted out of them, had to pay a little money to do so, and then they've dismissed that fee by now. And if it hasn't come to your location, it's part of the uh, globalist, shall we say, Agenda 21 of the United Nations, the Agenda 2030. So if you don't have it yet, it's coming. It's part of a worldwide rollout of the smart grid and the globalist um, agenda of monitoring and 
understanding energy use worldwide. So opt out of it. Say you want an analog meter. Say you want to keep your old meter. And probably the water meters, it happened just with the electrical meter, but I can imagine the gas meter and the water meter will follow soon with some kind of smart radio frequency blipping meter. You can turn off even the electric power in your home every night. But keep in mind, your greatest exposure is really from your immediate environment, is your appliances, your wireless appliances. So your cell phone and your router, your Wi-Fi router, if you have one, and any other wireless thing in your environment, any smart appliance that you choose to buy that will be blipping you with microwaves and millimeter waves. You have control over that. You don't have to choose that. Now, my fear is that I look around, I'd really like to buy an analog automobile. I'm really old fashioned <laughs> because my analog automobiles are old and wearing out. What am I going to do? There are none. There are none. Everything's got computers and it's got Wi Fi. And, you know, we have to demand, consumers must demand choice. We want analog. We don't need all this stuff. It's complex. And the analog things worked fine. So I think we need um, almost a consumer union to say, give us a choice. Everything doesn't have to be smart on the market. In the schools, I think we should uh, ban wireless devices. This was done in France in preschools. They banned Wi-Fi and wireless devices. That's a very smart move, but I haven't seen any movement toward that in this country. And the baby monitors in Europe are interestingly wired, but the American baby monitors are wireless. So I suggest you avoid them and get a European make. So earthing, here we go. Uh, take off your shoes, step on the bare ground, or your gardeners, touch the earth with your bare hands, touch plants. I always feel better after a long airplane ride going out getting grounded. It really makes a difference on your sleep and, and your well, sense of well-being to do this. And there's a literature on this. This is not hocus pocus. Uh, a scientific literature with several studies, both on technologies that are grounded, sometimes to the third plug on the outlet, and if you don't trust that as ground, then you can always ground them outside the window with a rod into good old Mother Earth. So sitting on the ground. I once had a dream about a colleague of mine. He had prostate cancer, pretty common, unfortunate cancer among men. And in my dream, I saw him meditating with his bare buttocks on the sand. He lived on the beach in Alameda, California. And I told him, I said, you know, I had this dream. And I said, I think it, it's a healing dream for you. And so he started to implement it by grounding his bare buttocks on the sand, meditating, and his prostate cancer went away. I, it was amazing. He didn't go the conventional route. So maybe we need more grounding, even of our buttocks on the ground, <laughs> in addition to our feet. So then they got these shoes that have these, these uh, metal things that ground our toes. And there's even one that grounds kidney one, a special meridian right in the center of the foot, the bubbling brook. And there's sheets you can buy with silver threads and cords that go out the window to the, or to the outlet uh, grounding thing and hoods that can be grounded. And there's a lot of different equipment on different websites that, that do grounding or you can just go out and do it for nothing. Meditate with bare feet on the ground and see how that feels instead of sitting in house. You can, and I, I thought I would do it here, but then it was really cold, so <laughs> I didn't get to do it yet. Uh, but people report better sleep, and, and the studies show better sleep, less pain, reduced stress, and improved immune function, and even one study that shows it may combat electromagnetic field stress of the type we're talking about here. So that is definitely a choice. And you can choose to do that every day, and I swear it'll improve your health. Our departure from nature has been our downfall as humans in terms of ill health, you know, as well as poor agricultural methods and not taking adequate care of our domestic farm animals. I mean, all of it is connected. Our departure from nature is, is making us sick in so many ways. And here's yet another way. So I also have a hypothesis, um, Harry and I have discussed this, that if we cultivate a higher vibration in our minds, what do I mean by that? Well, you know what I mean in an intuitive sense. And I don't know if it's really a frequency in the biofield that may be higher than our normal frequency, but, but it's about cultivating love and joy and gratitude and, and the positive affect. And we know from the literature on positive psychology that people who have this are healthier, they overcome disease sooner, 
and they feel good and they move around the world cheerfully and, and spread that among us. So I think if we were to cultivate positive affect, love and joy, we can possibly overcome some of these dire things that are upon us from the environment as well. And I encourage that. And in our laboratory, <coughs> excuse me a minute. <coughs> So we can actually test for, um, shall I say, love and joy, uh, especially uh, acute and in the moment bursts of love and joy using a detector that we've developed. Harry developed a dynamic emotional detector as we sought a, a chi detector to measure energy uh, coming from energy healers, uh, part of our lab work. Here's a picture of that sensor suite. Uh, with various, many environmental detectors. We measure alpha, beta, gamma emission, temperature, humidity, Earth's magnetic field, a slew of things, galvanic skin response, and then we have our subtle energy detectors shielded in these cans. And here's one of our subjects uh, influencing this detector with, uh, he's an energy healer studied in Russia, sending chi. And we also found inadvertently then these same detectors seem to respond strongly to positive affect. So I can watch a movie that's very uplifting and I can watch how I'm influencing the detector and, and data point every second I can see how uh, my vibration is improving. And then conversely, you have a conversation with someone right around the sensor suite and you talk about something like Microsoft, not my favorite company, lots of problems with the software and you watch the mood tank and how the detector responds in real time to that conversation where everybody's going, oh yeah, Microsoft, problems. So in conclusion, radiation from wireless technology poses hazards to our health. We're all at risk, not just the electrosensitive folks. And we're all, we all may be moving towards electrosensitivity as especially if we implement something that is worldwide with no white zones, no safe place to go away from it. We can expect 5G to be more hazardous than 4G or 3G because it adds to, it doesn't take away the others. We're adding new frequencies and escalating the antenna proliferation of 4G along with 5G. And it, the higher frequencies are known to be biologically more hazardous. So we need to take personal action through enhanced self-care. We need to realize that our immediate environment, we have control over it. We need to use the airplane mode more frequently. We need to demand more wired devices in our environment. We need to, to um, choose what's safe and spread the word so that people understand these things just because they're sold doesn't mean they're safe. Just like tobacco was sold for many decades and became a fad in our culture. Those of you who are my age remember a smoking world. <laughs> now it's just the opposite, almost worldwide. But uh, there was a lot of lung disease and other problems from tobacco, and we know better. So are we going to have to learn a tough lesson of learning what Wi-Fi does to our children and to our health? I hope not. So we need to take to reduce our exposure right now and use proven protective measures to improve our overall well-being and recognize that we have the most control over our immediate environment and choose wisely. In conclusion, let me read you this quotation by Rudolf Steiner, who uh, was a prophet well ahead of his times. A uh, hundred years ago, he wrote this. <clears throat> we must be quite clear about this. In the days when there were no electric currents, when there was no electric wires buzzing in the air, it was easier to be human. In those days, these aromantic forces, that's kind of bringing down to the physical materialistic level, were not there, constantly robbing us of our body, even when we are awake. It was not necessary then for people to make such efforts in order to approach the spirit. That is why it is necessary today to muster far stronger spiritual forces merely to remain human than it was a hundred years ago. And you know, he saw the advent of electricity. We're just talking about a wired world of tungsten lamps in his time, let alone the plethora of electrical devices that we've seen and now the wireless plethora of devices upon us. So I leave you with those words. He, he wrote other things about, in his spiritual writings about electricity 
There's quite a number of things that he wrote. This is just one piece. And I was really pretty shocked to, to recognize his prophetic wisdom. There's a book called Electricity and Life that someone recently wrote about how life has really had a hard time since electricity was introduced. Um, you know, we don't respect cosmic, geocosmic cycles. We don't go to bed when the sun sets like all other sensible animals. We'll stay up till, you know, wee hours of the night because we can and continue to work. And, and so if only we could, I don't want to turn the clock back, but make people recognize that we need to recover the power of nature in our lives. And I think this conference is one of the, most, the foremost conferences that I know of where people are thinking holistically from the microbial level of the soil and our guts all the way to the human spirit. And I'm glad to be among you. Thank you. Now, I have to repeat your question, so. Uh, no, that's right. The heart is not a pump. I mean, that was a Western view. And we tend to see things as pieces of technology. You know, there was a time when people thought the brain was like a computer. And then, uh, you know, now it may be a hologram, uh, but AI is going to define it again, I'm sure. And that's the world in which we live. I have to repeat your questions. Yeah. You can actually hook your phone up to a computer with a wire. Did you know that? There's a way to do that. Oh, if you're not at home. Um, well, can you turn it on airplane mode and then turn it on once an hour to take a look? Okay, then my suggestion is keep it um, some feet from your body at least. So you'll hear it ring. It can be maybe 10 feet away. And then, you know, we're going to figure out more protective technologies. I gave you a couple examples. But remember, that's not total protection. Oh, I'll tell you, um, we've measured them. I can tell you that all of the Apple phones emit more than the Androids, up to Model 10, and I haven't gone beyond that. So I haven't seen the new 5G phones, but I can imagine the line of Apple phones have always been stronger emitters than the Androids. I don't know the specific brands. I was measuring Samsung in general, and that was one of the lowest of the Androids. I don't have a list. No, because there's so many models, and uh, I just generally do workshops where everybody measures their cell phone and we have all the oscilloscopes and equipment set up. But we can't bring that on the road, uh, you know. But let me say uh, another thing. The decked phone emits more than any cell phone that I've ever measured. The decked phones are the most powerful emitters. That is your uh, digitally enhanced uh, uh, wireless landline. So I suggest you get rid of them or do a lobotomy on them. I remove the wireless function and I can give you instructions on how to do that. It means going into the bowels of the phone and cutting some wires. But then the satellites won't work and then you have a normal landline. Okay, um, you asked the question and I, I missed John Kemp's early part because I walked in late. He said something about solar radiation not always being healthy and I think he was referring to like uh, solar pulses. Uh, and uh, there was one that took down the telegraphs a long time ago, 1800s. There was so strong a burp from the sun that overrode the protective shield of the earth and then it knocked out all the telegraphs on that side of the earth that the sun burped on. <laughs> we could have something like that. It could destroy all silicon chips. It would really set us back to the Stone Age. So we don't really want that. We just want to use, we want our technology. We want to use it safely. Uh, and, you know, it, it could happen, but there's no way to predict that. You know, nobody's calculated um, in respect to the cost of infrastructure and, and the carbon footprint and all of those things. I haven't seen a single calculation of the enormous amount of material or um, energy that will go into uh, producing all these new 5G and smart devices, plus 42,000 satellites, plus launching them and maintaining them in lower Earth orbit. You know, things get out of whack, then they need to be uh, either taken down and new ones sent up. I mean, it's enormously energy and uh, material intensive. And the Greens should be on uh, all over against it. But you know what? Some of them say, more energy efficiency here. It's like, really? If you look at the full picture, I'm sorry, it isn't. It isn't. So I haven't even seen a collective view coming from the Green Party on this. So I'm kind of amazed. I haven't seen a total estimate of the rollout, but I know it's huge. Well, thank you so much. And that's a long thing for me to repeat, but let me just say the highlights in case you missed it over here. So uh, it's true that the FCC is not considering the numerous emitters or the numerous frequencies 
or even you know, Verizon's antennas here, but T-Mobile is here and at and is here, and we're getting zapped by all, all the telecoms and their separate little installations. Who's going to add it all up? We depend on the industry to do it because their cities aren't going to do it. And then he raised the issue that uh, smoking is one level of analogy, but the asbestos, um, the plethora of use of asbestos in our environment is perhaps a better analogy because it's out there, it needs to be removed. And now we're still going about removing it, knowing how toxic it is. So this the whole thing costs so much. Do we really want to put it up uh, without, without having an environmental assessment and impact report? At least that much. And 1969 NEPA law says we should. But who's doing it? Seems to mean nobody. But the Indians stopped it on their reservation and said, we need that done for our little sacred land. So you can't come here unless you produce one. Now, we could stand up and, and do the same. But I don't know. Lots of people don't like suing the federal government. There goes federal aid, you know. There are cities that are broke. So there's a lot of issues with any other questions. He had a lot more to say, but I can't summarize it all. <laughs> That's a problem. Anytime you're in a metal cage like your car, the, the radio waves come in through the windows, but the metal car will then reflect them back toward you. So you're actually getting a bigger dose. If you also put shielded paint on your walls or you put that bedding netting around your bed, don't put a, a wireless device inside a Faraday cage. It only reflects it back on you. You shouldn't be, no. Uh, if you need it for GPS, put it a little bit far away from you and let it be. Um, you know, I do it too now and then. But uh, don't make a habit out of it. Try to use it sensibly. Don't make it your lifestyle, in other words. Yeah, I have, you have to email me, and my email is, um, okay. You can go on my website and get it. I don't really put it, don't want to stick it on the microphone. I don't want the hacking or whatever. But uh, I will email out a document how you can lobotomize your decked phone, okay? okay. We're calling it that. It's kind of a joke. Uh, then it won't be wireless. It'll be just a landline. Then your, your satellites will be dead. You'll just use the main decked phone. And the other thing we have is uh, how to take the Wi-Fi out of your Wi-Fi router. If it has DSL hookup, the old Ethernet connection, we can tell you how to uh, remove the Wi-Fi. It's very hard to find just an Ethernet, the old DSL uh, router. So you have to know how to buy a modern one and then, again, remove the Wi-Fi. And then it's totally safe. It's totally wired. There's no Wi-Fi. And then your immediate environment is clean. So you have control over this. How would I summarize um, the strategies for activism? Is that what you mean? Well, I gave you a message here. I may not be allowed to do that in local governments because of the, the laws. But I think local governments better damn well hear this message. City councils, if they say, look, we have no jurisdiction and shut up already, well, they might react like that. But in some cities, they're not. They're standing up and they're suing the federal government. They're, they're taking stand. And, and I think we should do this. I think the way I see it, the FCC has become a captured government entity, captured by the industry. The industry tells them what to do. And they say, yes, sir, we'll do it, because they're all buddies. And, and, and then they write the laws and lobbyists pass them and legislators who get greased by the money of campaign money from big telecoms say, yeah, we'll get these laws passed for you. So I mean, this is the corruption that the, the loss of representation of the government for, of, and by the people and the, represent, the corporatocracy in which we find ourselves. So we have that. And you don't know what you're dealing with with your local government. So, I found out some of my local government was deeply involved with the self-driving car industry. And they always voted that way. So what could I do about that? So I mean, you, don't, you have to find out their interests. You have to find your allies, I think. You have to mobilize people. And, and you know, there's a lot of it going on in California. I'm, I've got emailing lists with going on in Berkeley about creating an emergency telecom city ordinance that excludes these uh, antennas from our residential and school regions. That's one thing going on. So there is a city ordinance. Take a look at your ordinance. It's online. Every city has a telecom ordinance. If your city doesn't have it, then your county has it. So read it and see if you like it. If you don't like it, then say, we want to change it. We want to change it tomorrow. 
and here we've rewritten it. We did that in Oakland, and guess what? Then they wouldn't accept it after we went through all the effort and we wrote, rewrote the city telecom ordinance. They said, sorry, so we're screwed. We couldn't get any, any headway there. So we've got to go at a higher level, county government, state government, and certainly federal government. And you know, I'm not an expert in activism, so I can't tell you how to fight those battles. I'm just a scientist trying to solve the problems at the levels I understand. But uh, if you want to be on a list of activists, I can put you on one that's in, largely in the East Bay of San Francisco. And you can read what they're doing, and maybe it's helpful. I don't know. Because the rollout is coming quicker to California. They always roll things out quicker there, it seems. I mean, the smart meters were first there, and you know, it seems like that's a strategy for the rollout. I have a microwave oven in my lab because I, wanna, I look at structured water, and I want to look at unstructured, disturbed water, and then I microwave it, because that's what microwaves do to water. In other words, there's a whole water science, and I spoke about this a little bit last year, briefly, at this conference. Um, Water takes on a memory of its environment and a structure according to um, even us, let alone its environment. And so when you microwave something, you're totally destroying an ultrastructure to water and, and rendering it lifeless, and it doesn't support your life very well. And I learned that when I was young and microwave food because I was lazy, and I got sick. And now I understand why, because there's a whole new water science out there about structured water and how we can revitalize water and restructure it. Uh, so what comes down the tap is also not very good and it needs to be structured, filtered, and many things. But microwaving is one of the worst things you can do for your health. And, if you, and, and not only leaking of microwaves out of there, but just microwaving food or water. Don't put a cup of water in there and make tea like that. Lots of people do. Boil it the normal way. Uh, wireless things produce more oxidative stress. They push us toward oxid redox in the oxidative way, which is what grounding does, which is what drinking high-energy ionized alkaline water does. So that's the part of the antidote. I didn't mention that, but I think I would add that to the list. Well, there's always calcium in the extracellular fluid, and the calcium from that fluid can get inside our cells at doses it doesn't belong. The cell re really wants to regulate calcium levels very, very highly because calcium is a second messenger. It really does a lot of, um, activates a lot of reactions in the cell. And if it's not within a certain limit, then you get a lot of other things happening that normally shouldn't happen. So it isn't coming out of your bones necessarily. It's just dietary calcium. and. There's always a level in the serum and plasma. Well, I, it's not recommended so much to take calcium supplements. I suggest you consume bone broth. You want calcium? Um, dairy products, fermented ones like yogurt and kefir, and then uh, bone broth is very good for giving you calcium. You have to boil it a long time. And there's books on bone broth, Weston A. Price Foundation. I contributed a recipe in there on oxtail bone broth, which is very medicinal. It's, it's a great thing for aging. And by the way, bone broth was the basis of the, some of the herbal preparations in China in their natural hospitals of, that do Chinese herbs. They start with broth, and then they add the herbs and boil. And that's what they feed to the elderly for rejuvenation and longevity. Yes, they can use chicken's feet. You use all the parts you don't eat, the carcass of the chicken that you didn't consume, the bones, the works, skin. Just throw that all in a pot, cover it with water, boil eight hours, a slow boil 24. It's very good. And then you can keep the jars in the freezer or take them out as you need them. Make soups. It's delicious. Yum. That's right. Exactly. So anyway, there's a lot of ways you can move forward gracefully here. I hope I didn't scare you too much. But I want to scare you so that you, you act, you make some nourishing changes in your life to avoid health problems from these things. That's part of my motivation. And spread the word. We need to get the word out because most people in the elevator, somebody said, what are you talking on? 5G, what is it? Oh yeah? <laughs> so the people don't even know what it is, let alone what action to take. So, so good luck. You're welcome.